Um, my name is Neil Daigle Oriens, and I am the visual arts manager here at Real Artways. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to mention that this conversation uh, is being recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, um, and we will share that link with you all um, after the event so you can share it with your friends. Our four speakers tonight will start the conversation together. Towards the end of the conversation, we will open the floor to questions. If you have a question and you're joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A function lo located at the bottom of your screen at any time during the talk. And if you're joining us on Facebook, feel free to post any questions on the video post because I'll be monitoring that as well. Closed captioning on Zoom is available. To, your, uh, to turn it on, click the CC icon located at the bottom of your screen and choose live transcript. And with that out of the way, I am going to turn it over to curator of the things that haunt me still, David Borowski. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank everyone for joining this artist talk tonight. I am Dave Borowski, the curatorial advisor here at Real Artways and the curator of this exhibition. It was uh, my pleasure, great pleasure to work with Flanders for the show. The work is provocative, thoughtful, and poignant, and visually stunning at the same time. So I hope you will come and see the show. And now it's up till May 30th. So the details are on realartways.org. Check out, you know what, check out a movie while you're coming to see the show, because uh, that's a good thing for the gallery too. So uh, let me uh, again, thank all you gentlemen for being on this, um, this discussion tonight. I'm gonna give it over to Philandis and he's gonna introduce you guys to everyone else. Thank you very much. Hey, what's up? Thank you guys for allowing me this opportunity. Uh, I just really want to um, briefly introduce uh, Noel Anderson and uh, KSA Lyman and um, uh, Charlie Braxton. Uh, these are uh, three people that sat with me through this project, held my hand, talked to me, gave me criticism, gave me things to read. And uh, I want to uh, introduce these guys to have just a brief discussion about the project. I hope you guys are able to check out the show. And um, also, I, I really wanna just bow out of this conversation because these guys have a, a lot to say. Noah's gonna read uh, a, a couple paragraphs about the show. Uh, PSA has a writing about the show and um, Charlie Braxton has a few poems to read and then uh, they'll enter into a dialogue. Thank you guys uh, for um, Charlie and uh, Charlie, Noel, and uh, my man, uh, KSA, for uh, doing this for me. And I'll chat with you guys after this is over. Thank you again. Oh, no. Man. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. We, we appreciate you. As the robot gets himself together, I got to put this. I'm over here on my screen with the, with the Cesare. Ooh, Cesare was, <laughs> I was on the notebooks. I was trying to return. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm writing. I'm, no, you mean, I'm writing. I'm good. I got you. I got you. I, I didn't have my thing open. I'm writing this essay uh, uh, for a publication that that, that I'm I'm using uh, Membe's Necropolitics and and Cesar's uh, note on the return to talk about what does it mean for the black uh, educator to go back to the school after a George Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to sit with this, like, what does it mean? And, and and particularly in predominantly white spaces, like. I'm 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 realizing that there's this there's this interesting relationship between uh, as as CLR James says uh, Western politics now and uh, uh, ancient Greece and I found that in ancient Greece you have the pedagogos which is essentially the house slave who is essentially the child's teacher and finding that I myself are, are kind of related to the the pedagogos which is the the ground root for pedagogue there we go so. Mm -hmm. I'm finding myself in this weird kind of slave moment in the in the institution. So you got to bear with me. I got like 40 <laughs> books on my screen right now. Uh, okay, so yeah. So thanks, Flip, man, for, for allowing me uh, to, to sit with these giants of, of, of language um, and, and read a couple of words. Charlie really helped me through this text because he helped me re-edit it. Um, Flip asked me to write a couple of words to just express uh, express what the show could could be possibly doing. Um, so let me just see how fast I can get through, but not too fast. 
The title, Ambitions of Thames Vale, A Ride to Recuperation. Listening to Tupac Shakur's Ambitions as a Rider is like listening to Death Row remix of the soundtrack to Kubrick's The Shining. There's a psychotic physicality to how the instruments are deployed. The rapper's deep, menacing voice initiates the ride. I won't deny it. I'm a straight rider. Drop piano. You don't want to fuck with me. Tupac Shakur's refrain is haunted by a ring announcer's hollow voice. Let's get ready to rumble. Thus begins the opening track of Pac's 1996 triumphant LP, All Eyes on Me, as a doubled beginning, Ambitions as a Rider activates an album whose illogic trap between being a sickness and irrational weaves a dark, toxic, and tragic future. He conjures a hyper-masculinized Blackness who parades in the converse hypersexualization of Black women and is motivated by a death drive that stereotypically characterizes Black male youth lyrically affirming the ability to secure, to secure one's own death. Quote, I'd rather die before they capture me. Tupac, in end quote, Tupac extends his alliance with death by performatively conjuring an ally and cautionary mirror. Quote, fuck doing time. Won't catch me like they did my nigga Tice, end quote. Trailing off at the end of the line, a reference of the conviction and imprisonment of Mike Tyson seems an appropriate speculation and point of departure. After leaving prison, Tyson reemerged in familiar stomping grounds, returning to the ring to resurrect an already defutured boxing career. Tyson employed Ambitions as a Rider as his entrance song. Deploying Pac's anthem as a shield, Tyson and Entourage march to the, march to the ring in mass, from which emerge a mixtape of affirmational Black patriarchal slogans. Yes, yes, champ, Allah Akbar, wake up, wake up, Philadelphia, Allah, yes, read together. These elements effectively represent black terror, intimidation, and trauma. And this is precisely what Tyson set out to do when he said, I'm ferocious. I, I want your heart. I want to eat his children. Praise be to Allah, end quote. Like Pac's song and the masses chants, this scene of intimidation is internally motivated by fear. Tyson discloses his quote unquote ring walk inner monologue when he says, quote, when I come out, I have extreme confidence, but I'm scared to death. I'm totally afraid. I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of losing. I'm afraid of being humiliated, dot, 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 end quote. Now, please understand, and I will finish. And this is not a plea to excuse the horrific behaviors of a man because of his race. This is an attempt to begin to understand the extent to which white supremacy and capitalism tax the Black psyche. More importantly, this is a brief analysis which allows me to locate the emerging brilliance of the beaded works of Philandus Thames. Tyson and his associated mas toxic masculinity is an appropriate ground against which to measure Thames' pursuit of black representation. One of his newer works that attempts to initiate the capture of particular forms of toxic black masculinity is a photographic representation of Mike Tyson in the form of a beaded cur curtain. While I think the translation of photography of Tyson into interior design is an achievement, can we talk about the significance of chosen form? It should be lost on no viewer that the extent to which Tim's beads capture and redress one of the stages of Tyson's rage, the ring walk. Beyond this point, imagination is required. And I yield the floor. Mm. Mm. So can we talk about that? Or what, 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 we, what we doing? What we I mean, doing? I don't, I, listen. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a lot to unpack. I want to um, get I want to get into that. That ambitions as a rider, you know. You you remember you remember when Tyson came to the ring? Who did he beat up that night? He probably beat up the. Remember that might have been his his comeback because he was just yeah. beating up on losers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He beat up that kind of like he was on that like Ali thing where you know Ali beat. Remember Ali beat up like Jerry Connolly or something, right. some fool like some journeyman like that, and he brought this. Was he was like this? Uh, was he Irish guy? He came out. He beat. Oh, him. Mick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's yeah. what it was. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah. But but, but I feel like that was the. I mean, I feel like what you just read, fam, like just made me think about how Park and and and, and Tyson just. It, it's strange, right? Like, I think we talk about them similarly, but I think for a lot of folks who are you know the age of like Philanders and definitely Charlie's age, I mean, we remember. We remember when Pac was like the little nigga, like the little nigga from Digital Underground, right? Mm -hmm. And like, and, and what's yeah. interesting is that Mike never mm -hmm. got to be that, mm -hmm. right? Mike never got to be that little nigga, but 
But I think for Landis in this and 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 what we're watching and what we're sort of talking about now makes me think of both of them, fam. Like that kid who never got to be that kid, yep. and that little nigga on Digital Underground who was who had the ambitions as a writer. I never mm-hmm. thought about that till hearing what you just did, fam. But you I think there's a lot to, to talk about in there. Okay, but, let's but think about I, it this I, way. Oh, go ahead, Charlie. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, but I, I think it's also important to understand that society forced both very pop and Tyson to be the persons that they became. Yeah. That were not the people that we know. They were very sensitive, right. very introspective, young black men who were forced by the forces of white supremacy and capitalism to become the aggression, the yep. aggression or the picture of aggression just to survive. Let's let's talk about that because I, I mean you know we just lost one of the great pioneers, one of the great pioneers of nineties rap right yeah you know DMX AKA Earl went home right. right and that doesn't excuse his behavior because you know he had a problematic life however his sister I don't know if you all have seen it his sister yeah. came out and did did this talk of, or she did like kind of a a, a, a kind of po- post on a podcast or something where she recorded and talked about his life and I was like it's the same thing that Mike Tyson had. He yeah. went through the system, and as he went through the system, he learned not to trust, right? right? He just learned that, you know, I will get them before they get me. Right. Yeah. And that is just, that is just like, and that's the thing, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the thing that it's, it, it has been, it has been woven into us by, by way of slavery, right? That yeah. kind of like, that kind of DNA, that epiphenomenal uh, uh, trauma that gets passed down to us, right? You know? There are things. There are things that I have to believe my father went through back in the, the 30s that still affect me. You know, affect my DNA today. And and what's a shame with with Mike Tyson is that not only is he dealing with all that trauma that was done to him in a present moment, he's also having to deal with the trauma that happened before he even got here. Right. You and know? then understand, being a boxer, that's a traumatic experience in and of itself. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, when you step in that ring. You, you're subject to die, but you're definitely subject to get your ass kicked mm-hmm. if you don't kick some ass. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, and, and he even talks about in the documentary how Custom Auto and all of the trainers sort of kind of forced him to be an animal in many ways, to yeah. think and act like an animal. Right. You know, um, so he didn't have time to think about the implications of what his actions were. He was forced to be aggressive. You don't have time to sit around and be uh, complimentative of, am I being, am I hurting these people because I'm hurting myself right. mm-hmm. and I'm acting out this pain mm-hmm. because in order for you to think about that, it forces you to look at the world around you and what that world is doing to you. Right. And you know what? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in whether or not y'all think there's a difference between being what people, some people call hypermasculine and uber aggressive and selling hypermasculinity and uber aggression. Because I think sometimes we talk about Tyson for sure, the conflation is he, you know, he, he was the embodiment of a particular kind of hype, black hypermasculinity of what people now, some people call toxic masculinity. But I'm interested in like whether we can delineate between like those brothers being that and those brothers having the whatever to sell that. Do you know what I mean to sell that to people? Right. Well, right. I mean, the forces of capitalism has long been enamored with the black male as the boogeyman. Right. I mean, they've sold that from the black exploitation movies, because I'm, I'm I grew up in the 70s, on up through hip hop. Right. I mean, when you think about the, the 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 connection between the black exploitation movies and hip hop, so-called gangster rap, the parallels are very, very similar. Right. right. You know, hypersexual, hypermasculine, hyperviolent. Mm-hmm. And bear in mind that the majority of this mu- this music that's being put out there is being shaped by market forces that we don't control, we don't mm-hmm. own. And the majority of the uh, demographics that they're pushing this to are white suburban kids. Right. Mm-hmm. But, but let me clap back on that a little bit. We don't own, but we participate. Right, we do participate. Like there, there's, there's. It, it, it reminds me of like, um, 
if we if we stick within the parameters of boxing. And then I want to go to one of the images. I think there's, a, there's an interesting conversation we can have the distinction between Clarence Thomas and Mike Tyson, two, two black men and that center around Anita Hill. Let's have that conversation, shall we? <laughs> um, before we go there. Um, so, okay. In terms of like the, the parameters of boxing and that very same argument we're having about the participation in, in, in what I guess Foucault would call like the, the, the reabsorption of the technology of racism, like you bring that shit home, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is Muhammad Ali and, and, and Joe Frazier? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky and Muhammad is, is our God. But the things that he said about Joe Frazier right. yeah. for a specific complexion of black people was problematic. Right? That's, a, yeah. that's a nice word. Right, yeah, I'm, that's listen, a sweet word. <laughs> listen, listen, feel me, but you feel me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel you. I feel like you. There were, I remember going to school with a brother who was, who looked just like Joe Frazier, and people, while they didn't call him Joe Frazier, they might have called him something else that was correlate right. to what you know, a animal, these kinds of things. Right. So, so there is a way in which I, I always, I, I understand our critique of of of, of how we project it external, but I always want to be conscious that we are complicit in the participation of the, the kind of re-presentation of some of this imagery, you know what I mean? I, I agree. Uh, yet at the same time, we also must bear in mind the, as we were talking about Richard Wright and the times in which he was born, um, we have to understand that Muhammad Ali was born in a time where white supremacy had pushed these images of whiteness as the standard of beauty. Mm -hmm. And he has internalized that. And then he projects that internal, uh, internalization onto the rest of the world via Joe Frazier, his insults of Joe Frazier. Yeah, right. Tough. You okay. see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Let's, can we, can we, um, can we go to one of the images in the show? Cause I, I was, I actually, I think it's a good segue to talk about the distinction between uh, two forms of black masculinity within emerging within the same kind of field within the nineties and popular media. So can we, is there a close, actually we just, the whole image is fine. Wow. Uh, so there's yeah. the Anita Hill, Hill beaded works uh, yeah. to the left of the image, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking about this work in relation to the Tyson and also, you know, thinking about all other forms of black masculinity uh, that that kind of circulated in media at the time, right? And I, I was I'm really interested in this distinction between right now a specific kind of class of blackness that is Clarence Thomas, and how he gets ushered up into an honor a, a position of honor, right? Hmm. Versus another kind of class of blackness, which is Mike Tyson. Right. Hmm. I mean, are are there any thoughts that we could we could pick up on that? Because well, we have to look at the the role that Clarence Thomas plays in the upkeep and maintenance of capitalism and white supremacy. Right. Okay. As long as you're useful to those two entities, you will be pushed up. Mike Tyson was a symbol of, how would you put it? Somewhat of a symbol of black resistance, a complex symbol, mm -hmm. but nevertheless a symbol. Now, all the while, they're making money off of this, but he's not maintaining the status quo. He's not pushing the status quo in the way that Clarence Thomas is. Clarence Thomas became a Supreme Court justice who, in my opinion, well, I like to call him as Amir Baraka called him, Tom as Clarence. <laughs> 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 you know, but some of his decisions, sometimes you look at his decisions and you, you're looking at the people that those decisions affect negatively, mainly people of color, mm -hmm. and you wonder, does he have any relationship to us? Does he have any love for us? <laughs> Seriously. No, for real. But you know what? If we, if we use that rubric, I think that's where the exhibition and I think this conversation gets 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 tough because what I want to do is ask the hard I mean I think this exhibition makes me ask the hard questions right like we grew up Flanders and I grew up the same time the same city few miles apart and we Tyson was our god no question mm -hmm. right but you know it's like a lot of that shit that came out of New York it, it's all good until you start asking yourself whether those New York gods have any love for you you know what I mean? As a, mm. as, as a black Southerner. 
or as a black mm-hmm. person, period. So while it's easy to talk about Clarence Thomas and all of his fuck shit, I think it's a lot harder to talk about Tyson's fuck shit as it relates to race and Anita Hill's fuck shit. Because people, people like I think casually forget that Anita Hill was a is a centrist at best. Do you know what I'm saying? So if we're gonna do that thing where we're like we're gonna critique these these incredible images that are I think being like weaved and weaved out of our consciousness and our memories, I want to do the hard work, which is which is which is which is push up against Tyson and Anita Hill the same way we would push up against Clarence Thomas. That's well, let let if you, you you're gonna go there, brother, because <laughs> you you just open a can of worms. Especially I mean, you, you talk- know, you know. Especially when you talk about Anita Hill, because keep in mind, she was um, working with Clarence Thomas, knowing his politics, having no problem working with him. You know, um, my grandmother taught me um, the best thing to do when dealing with the devil is don't. Right. Right. You know, don't participate. Yeah. Yeah. Because that becomes... Mm. That makes you implicit in, if not complicit, in right. his in his or her actions. No doubt. Mm. And that's why I love the distort. I mean, I'm gonna call it, hmm. I'm gonna call it like distortion of these images because to me it 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 churns and, and it reminds me of that time in the 80s and the 90s where we were literally making fucking heroes, black hero. I mean, there was a point, y'all. When black households tried to make a hero out of Clarence Thomas, you remember that? Remember that? Like, the, but for a second, because they were like, wasn't "Oh, there's he a, black... a hero in my household." No, but... he wasn't no hero. But I remember for a second, fam. For, for some a second, people, yeah, not for. I mean, listen, real talk. We can talk about it. I feel you, but you're right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but fam, look, I mean, we can. I mean, and if we really gonna talk, talk, we can talk, talk. You know, you know, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw tried to get all kind of black folks to step up and stand up against Clarence Thomas. And if we really want to talk about it, and this is where it gets very complicated, she didn't find any any of the black quote, quote unquote leaders at the time, woman, any black women or men necessarily to step up there with her. And so I'm just trying to say, to mm-hmm. me, it's just interesting how we make these heroes, make heroes out of black folk who kind of don't give a damn about us. And I'm not trying to like say we fucked up for that shit, but I like to talk about what that means. And I think we did this. I think Tyson is an example of it. I think. Pac is not an example of it, but I definitely think Anita mm-hmm. Hill might also be an example of it, you know? Yeah, 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 okay. Well, I mean, no, one, let's, we let's have- go there, though. Let's go there, because there is a way in which we prop certain certain folks in the community up. Obama? Yeah. No, for real, yeah. Yeah. Right? And so then that, that, that begs a really interesting question, like, I don't know how to put it without sounding kind of, you know, fucked up, but it's like, who do which which form of leadership or model do we do we ascribe or prescribe our, ourselves to? You feel me? Because they're they're not all going to do everything for us. No. Well, some of the thing, I think we need to look at how leadership is also projected to us. Mm. Understand, uh, Clarence Thomas is not gra- from the grassroots, as Malcolm X would say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He was created. He was nurtured by a system. And the thing is, you know, with us, I know, I know my grandmother was one of those who, if he was black and in a position, you had to support him. Right. But that's you that see generation. what I'm saying? Yeah, right. but that's that generation. That's that generation. And that's that generation. It's, it's aspirational because we're attached to that particular individual via our skin. But, you know, as we say in the street, all skin folk, Ain't you kin folk? Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? You know, so we have to look at you know Clarence through a class analysis as well as a race analysis. Right. And when you look at things through a class and race analysis, you find, and and a gender analysis too, you find that some of these quote unquote leaders ain't for us. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I mean, um, none of the leaders are for us. Mm-hmm. None of them are for us, but like I'm interested in like the motherfuckers that we that we that we also know ain't for us, but we like how they create art so much we imagine that they are. Right, that's, well, what okay. I, that's what I. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say let's flip to another image and let and let wait a minute now. I, I Charlie, I, 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 did you want to read something? Somebody else want to read something? I don't want to bogart the conversation. Uh, 
TSA, I mean, I can read something, or do you want to read something? We can something? just keep it going. Let's keep I it going. I just want to talk, man, but I'm good with whatever, whatever, whatever. So the, let's go here, because there's a piece okay. in the show that is the um, the basketball hoop that's a oh, kind of long black basketball hoop piece. Do we have that one? That one. Yeah. Can we talk about this? Ooh, we. Ooh. Oh, we. Oh, whoa. Flex on them. Whoa. Go ahead. Talk that, about it, man. That mug, man, you know what that thing did to me? Is um and one it it's the it's the shadow, but also it's just it's just uh like I mean I guess Philan has asked me to come on here to talk the way I talk, but it's just my memory in my house of making basketball hoops out of the same thing that sometime my mama would use to whip my ass. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like like it's a it's a I've never I've never seen an image that made me feel like as much joy. And also as much like, fuck, I remember that. I remember that, you know, like, like some of us remember them clothes hangers and, and, uh, and, 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 and the joy and terror that, that like they brought. And I just never, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. And um, I, Charlie, I know, you know. Well, and, and it connected also to a whip. Yeah, no terror. doubt. You know, which, which keeps it, keep in mind that, that terror that our parents brought to us terror. is rooted in the in the terror that was brought to them via that whip, and yep. via their ancestors. Yes, that is. was passed down in our DNA. Right. So Ooh. it goes there. It goes. It's it's the it's the it's the chattel of the neck. Yes. You know yes. The block yep. that put around the neck that keeps you moving. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's it's if I get if I listen I, I grew up in the church if I get biblical biblical with it it's the serpent. <laughs> The yeah. serpent, yeah, the snake, you know I mean? yeah, the levitating serpent. So there, there's a there's a particular kind of like black black horror, black terror in this object, right? Which is interesting because it it emerges from a a, a territory that's all about black ascendancy, mm. athletics, right? Mm. It's that, exactly. It's that, it's that if you can't shoot a jump shot, what the fuck are you gonna do with your life, kind of thing? Yeah, right? you either got a wicked jump shot. <laughs> You know, but and bear in mind, it's also a commentary on the sports industry in and of itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And how that heart. exploits our athletes yeah. and exploits black men and, and exploits black women now. I mean, look at the disparity between black female basketball players, mm -hmm. black female athletes and, and female athletes in general and male athletes. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a layered conversation that's going on that Philandis is, is has here. Yeah, it, it's it's curious because I haven't seen this show yet, but I would be curious <laughs> where this object lays or, or or resides in relation to the rest of the show. Like if if this is on the wall uh, next to Anita Hill and she's staring at this object versus staring at another way. Oh, that's a good. That's a that's that's a very right, good they're, they're, observation. Right there, these, these kind of tenuous, mm -hmm. particular precarious moments that can occur between works, right? Like like between poems or between chapters. There are yeah. moments where you could find things, right? You could you could you could find moments, but there there was something you said, uh, uh, Kay, about the, the the kind of trauma that it reminded you of. Right. And I was I, I don't know if you all had this because I had it when I was growing up. You know, I grew up. My father was born in 26. Um, you know, he 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 would tell you, you know, go get my belt, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he would give you that same old shit. This hurts me more than you wouldn't let me whip you for a little bit. You feel right. me? Um, <laughs> but but I, I found a community with other black people, other black people my age at school. Be like, oh, you oh, we would share these experiences and these narratives about when our parents had uh, reprimanded us, you feel me? And it created this weird kind of community of, of a celebration of the punishment. I just realized that. Ooh. Let's get into that, fam. Let's get Ooh. into it. Please, but, let's but, go. But, but did it, did, okay, hmm. did, did you all create the comic in order to get into what we call the traumatic? Or do you feel like you, you needed the traumatic uh, you needed the comic to uh, like what what role does the comic play in these conversations? Because I feel you like whenever I'm around black folks and ever I want to like give folks a laugh or break tension, all you got to do is start talking about getting your ass whooped, right? Like, oh shit, I remember that. My mama used to right. put a grenade on my motherfucking mouth and blow that shit up. Oh, not you, you know? But, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 is it? I I don't know. I I don't want to. I don't want to do the thing where I'm like, oh, we're just reinscribing the trauma. But I mean, maybe that's true. But I wonder if it. I wonder if the comic. Is actually doing something more when we when we when we think back to these to these 
<laughs> oh, I would I would think wow. of it like if we think about the comic and the way prior functions, right? right? The way the way prior develops a community, right? right. And, and and I think I think what prior does brilliantly is he develops a black community amongst other white folks, right? Where he'd be like, you know, he'll make fun of a white guy coming back to his chair, and black people are like, that's right, that's how it feels. That's right. right. <laughs> he put white folks on black. Right, right. It's that yeah. kind of community, I think. You see what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. I definitely do. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely yeah. Do. So. Oh, go ahead. Sir. I, let me read something that relates to uh, trauma. And when Philandis was working on um, the beaded pieces, the first one that he showed me was the. piece from the um, Rodney King. Do we have that? I don't know if we have it. I think it's over yes, there. we do. Mm -hmm. There it is. You see it? It's on the other far, side yeah, of the right. The yeah, three, right. right. So it got me to thinking about um, the current situation that we see these rash of police uh, killings and murders and things of that nature. And so I wrote this poem called Blues Elegy for Black Bodies. Mm. Dark clouds, marshmallow thick, hang low over city streets. Gotham sleeps while cops creep through dark alleys and ghetto thoroughfares, looking for suspects lurking in the shadows of fear and death their souls trapped somewhere between the want for freedom and the need for justice. Despite all of the respectability politics our Negro politicians can fathom, we remain caught in the nightmarish game, the great American pastime of watching crooked cops kill black people in the holy name of God and country, law and order and all that other Ringling Brothers shit caught on body cams that never seem to work when it comes to us getting justice as a brown body bleeds in the dead of a hot spring night, another black soul stolen by the state for the simple crime of walking home in the rain, playing in the park, riding in a car with their family, or just obeying the law by raising their hands toward heaven, hoping to Jesus, they make it home safe and in one piece. Too often our hopes go unrealized. Too many times our questions go unanswered. Too many times our prayers go unheard and our dreams go unfulfilled as we commit yet another course to this cold and virulent earth. Mm. Okay. Mm. okay. Well, Philandis jumped on there. Mm. So wait a minute, Charlie. Can I ask a question? Sure. Was that uh, was that in response to the work? That was in response to after seeing that was took place after watching it, when he showed me the first image uh, that I saw was the um, Rodney King piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know what's interesting? I always thought that was Mitch Blood Green. <laughs> 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 remember, you remember, you know what? Yeah. But it, but like, but, but it was because of all of the other. Uh, I, I saw the other images right, first, right, right. and I mean, Mitch Blood Green got y'all remember his face after Tyson got him. Oh right? yeah, 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 yeah. It's really us all, brother. <laughs> Say it again. I said it's really all of us. That's what I think. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah. But let's go back because there's I don't want to gloss over because this is important. There's there's something we could talk about or we should talk about the kind of fatigue of this of these moments, right? And there's there's so many things with these moments that black folks I've talked to since hell, since last summer, um uh that that all surrounded by this term fatigue. I'm 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 fatigued of watching us die. I'm fatigued or I'm tired of having to teach white folks about you know uh seeing me as a human being uh oh oh I, I remember this one i'm just maybe you all could throw other ones at me because this could be fun uh i remember there were a lot of my white colleagues were like hey can i do you do you have a reading list like 
I, bitch, I'm, I don't have any. I'm not. I'm not giving you a reading list. <laughs> you know, like I, I make it Black History Every Day. I don't need a month. Like, what are we talking about? So you I'm know, not go ahead, go ahead. You know what I think is dope about you about us starting to talk about this. I think differently than people have been talking about it. Hopefully, is that this was the first time I realized that like I'm the only one in my family who's having these conversations about talking too much to white people because, mm. you know, you have to actually be in proximity to white folk to have that conversation. You know mm. what I'm saying? You, you, gotta, uh, okay. you, gotta, you gotta be around, you gotta, you gotta be around, which means you sort of have to rely upon white folk to have a conversation. And as we know, most of our people are not. So it's just so interesting, again, once we think about that class dynamic where those of us who are in proximity to them all the time, intellectually and all this other shit, yeah, we tired of blah, blah, blah. But when I try to explain that shit to my other, some of my people, they like, wait, why are you talking to niggas anyway? I'm like, oh, it's work, fam. Like, uh -huh. like, you know, so I don't know. I don't know. I just think we could do something no, with that. I, no, no, for, I, I, yeah. I hadn't considered that, though, right? Because, I mean, real talk is... You know, I live up here in Harlem on, on 132nd Street. You know, you turn right down 132nd, you you go on west. It, it it looks different than when you if you if you turn left. You feel you feel right. and mm. and quite frankly, Whole Foods is towards the right. It ain't towards right. the right. And there's a whole demographic uh, uh, of of racial destruction right you know, happening in that space. And and there are these kind of moments when and it's it's weird. But there are these moments when you you see like young white couples walking down that side of the street like ain't that like someone right. didn't get shot two days ago in front right. of that Vega. right? Mm. You know, so there's all that is just swimming in my head with, right now with this work. You did yes. all that, and, plus, mm. and the fact that this word pleasure is is like in the middle. It is the, it is the anchor, right? And we all we all know that the code the coded uh, uh, pleasure where this comes from, right? Yes, this, right. Right. This, this isn't a kind of pleasure that is like, you know, uh, the pleasure of learning, the pleasure of education, mm. right? This is a different kind of education, it's right? Newport pleasure. There you go. Send Newport, Newport, Newport pleasure. Send them to the Newport. Send but you know what's Newport. also interesting when you say the Newport, it's the also whose pleasure is it? There we Ooh. go. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay. okay. Ooh. Ooh. Who is deriving the pleasure from all of this black misery? Listen, listen, if we look at it from that lens, right? And we see the structure itself, one, as a white frame and two, as a chalkboard. Come on now, the, the gaze, the gaze is what it is. The, 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 it, it, it's telling us what it is, right? right. <laughs> so then, so then my, my real question is to, to piggyback on what you said, Charlie, who's the speaker here? Because I want to remove Philanis out of the, of the generator of the idea and think that this could, if I if I walk in here blind, I can think this could be a whole nother being doing this, doing this speaking. That is not Philan. Did you feel me? Mm. Right, there's that's interesting that we could talk. There's an ambiguity for me. And if I don't know Philanis at all, there's an ambiguity, but who's the author of the work and what they what they could be trying to get us to do. You feel me? Well, but it's the ambiguity that's forcing us to think. Yes. Yes. You, you see what I'm saying? It's that space mm -hmm. that. It's not clear cut who's there that's forcing us to think. I like that. Who's there? And I and I think there's space in this. I think there's space in this to 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 work with, with 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 pleasure earning the POV here. You know what I mean? I think we want to often give POV to like anim and um you know uh, uh beings. But 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 again, like I I just wonder what happens if if pleasure is the is is the POV right? Like like we if we're looking at all of these things from variations of pleasure which actually i think we are because i think i think we're I, th I think we all fetishize the black body yeah and we do i mean I'm, as we're being fetishized as black bodies yeah. you know right it's true i mean i i can't i can't say that uh that being mesmerized by everything that is lebron james isn't a isn't a kind of a fetishization of him, and also a critique of my fetishization, and uh, and no doubt, and, and his and the oppression that surrounds that body, even though he looks like he is totally liberated, he is not right. a true sovereign. You feel me? Right. Um, so that's that. But let's but let's let's stick there because there's something that you just said that was we're talking about whose POV is the pleasure, right? And I, I'm I'm consistently thinking about uh, this conversation I have with this, this brilliant artist 
Derek Adams a few years ago, when he started making these works, these paintings about black people in swimming pools. Mm. And I was like, when has anyone ever done an entire show about black leisure? Wow. I think every mm. time I go to an exhibition, there is black grief. And I deal, I, I traffic in black grief nonstop, for real. <laughs> but, you know, so trying to grapple with my own death, considering Good. that I'm walking Good. outside, they're going to kill me. You feel me? I'm trying to get to that that Heideggerian if I can or hey Hegelian if I can just get over my own death I'm gonna move on we're gonna be good right, right? Mm -hmm. but real talk is when is that conversation about black leisure and black joy ever been like manifested in like a in hip hop this I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. argue hip hop maybe I was thinking about art exhibitions but let's go there yes oh no let's, let's talk about art exhibitions then because that that because we could go we're gonna go probably too deep if we go hip-hop but i mean i'm sadly that's the only place i i can say that i've seen it you know let's go to hip-hop take us there well I, I, or, and you could also say funk yeah because because music is a is a yeah it's a celebration of joy and liberation is it leisure? That's 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 what I love about okay. funk, and I love about we got you here, Charlie, because you are you can talk about all things funk. Mm -hmm. It's like you know why I didn't go to funk is because it's joyful, but it was like the presentation of it was like the opposite of leisure. You know how in hip hop, like we you know we got flow, which implies a kind of leisurely like movement through the with the music with the rhyme. I didn't know if we had anything equivalent to that in funk. Was there like a leisure performativeness to funk? Well, I mean, you think about look at look at George Clinton. Look at Parliament. I would think that. Look at Parliament Funkadelic. I mean, it was all about. I mean, dance, funk, leisure, do your thing, mm. smoke a smoke, fire up a joint. Yeah, but, but you know. But yeah, but let's think about the the key word, right? I think the key word is play. Yeah. Like, what play. they did on that yeah. stage, like let's be real, a black man coming out of the mothership. What? what? Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Or or, and, or or imagining what he did with language, right? All those syllables, all that word jammed in together to make a whole nother context, a construct yeah. of language, right? And, and then you, like Sun Ra, but go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but then you got to look at the time in which funk emerged because funk really took root just after the civil rights movement. So mm -hmm. black people as a collective had a sense of, we can do anything. It's no, ain't no stopping us now, which is, you know, one of my favorite songs. Yeah. Uh, we were in a position where we felt we could breathe to have that leisure. Yeah. And keep in mind the leisure suit, which was real popular among right. some black folk. I'm old and I'm I'm really old here. I'm <laughs> <telling> <laughs> <about> myself <laughs> because I had one. Oh but, uh, no! no. Oh, yes, <laughs> but, I mean, look, look, look. Keep in mind, Key. I was born in 1961. Yeah. I'll be 60 come this June. Damn. Knock on wood. I feel Man, I always forget. I always think we the, I always think we the same, but you you closer to my mama age, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my and my I'm saying that because my mama, oh, my mama, I always think about my mama okay. as being your teacher, but it's also because my mama was so young when she started. Exactly. You know I mean? Charlie, and, he and said also in love. It's also, go ahead. It's also because Charlie never stopped. Charlie, you one of the people who never stopped loving art or music. You know what I mean? I think old folks sometimes fall out of love with that shit. And I saw this, I'm like, damn, I always think Charlie my, my age. I'm like, damn, this nigga's 60. Yeah. Well, I mean, the key thing is you got to keep listening to the music because the music evolves. Yeah. Black people evolve. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's and if, you, if you're not, on, I mean, I talked to Philanders. Philanders, because it's all, and you, yeah, Philanders is always trying to get me to listen to somebody new. Yes. You know? And you and, are and too. I'm like, well, you know, I'm now, what's yeah, interesting new is, jazz as well. Not, yeah, not new jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New jazz, Jason Moran, John Baptiste. So it, it's, it's very important that you stay current. You know, like You're my right. mentors were Miri Baraka, Jerry Ward, Kalamu Yasalam. Mm. Um, uh, 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 Askia Muhammad Ture, and you know, they stayed on top of stuff, right? They stayed right. on top of stuff, so you have to stay on top of stuff. But when you think going back to hip hop, when you go back to those early days of hip hop, its root was in funk, no doubt. You know, you it, it started out, they used to call it electro funk, what yeah. Bambada did, what um. Grandmaster Flash, they all dressed like funk artists, mm -hmm. which later on um, 
Andre 3000 tried to pick up on, right. but we were disconnected from that funk era that we started clowning Andre. Right, right. But most of the people who were clowning him were Northerners. Yeah. Because uh -oh. us Southerners are like, hey, that's out that, there. You know, that's your home. weird cousin that you right. love. That's you better not say nothing about my cousin. So what? He liked to wear long hair and mm -hmm. it's blonde. Yes, indeed, fam. And hey, you know what? Oh. Southern playlistic oh. Cadillac funky music is an ode to Parliament. Exactly. Wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's bring you in then, Flip, because, um, well, first of all, a shout out to, uh, if, if no one has, if you all haven't seen the show, you should see, you did this for everybody listening to us, uh, Tours from the Tour Bus. It, 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 Tours from the Tour Bus, the animation, I don't know if you all seen that, where they, 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 they interview like uh, uh, Clinton and his whole crew and they make this animation out of it. Yeah. And, and they give that backstory stuff that you're all, that we talking about. And you read, like when they do acid and they, they, they do acid <laughs> at Harvard and it all shit, all hell breaks loose. I'm just saying that's interesting. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but I'm just, my question for Philanders, man, for real is a real question. What role is, what role does music play in, in the space? Whether it's the work here, whether it's the studio, whether it's your thinking, whether it's your rhythm. What role does music play? I think music is the most central part of my studio practice, actually. I wake up uh, every day uh, and, and listen to music, analyze, uh, analyze different stuff, uh, different nuance, uh, parts of the conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, uh, like uh, one of the conversations I remember having in my studio postgraduate school uh, was with Carrie James Marshall. And uh, this was literally the first studio visit with anybody in my studio. And uh, he was doing a talk at Yale and he, he, I met him, he came over to my studio and we sat for about three or four hours just talking about the work. And he said to me, um, have you thought about listening to the things that you make work about? Like, like really going back and listening to the hip hop that was going on when you were in your formative years, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just remember like thinking, damn, I never thought to do that and mine that space. And then some of the work um, that I did, I guess for the Jenkins Johnson show uh, about, uh, it's been about nine years ago was the first iteration of me showing that kind of work, uh, you know, but music has always been central to uh, my, my life, my practice. I, I make music, uh, well, Charlie knows this, uh, but I, I, I do music production as just a kind of a hobby, you know, making beats and stuff like that as a way of expressing myself. But I'm in constant dialogue with different musicians from, you know, most deaf to fiend and, um, and, and, you know, Charlie and I talk about, like, the, you can't separate poetry from um, music, you know. Uh, we think about some of the great uh, uh, poets, including Mir Amiri Baraka, they all wrote uh, music. So it's been a, a, a very interesting, like, you know, it's been a very important part of my practice. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. It makes, it makes sense. It makes total sense. Like, you know, even when I'm at the studio, you you send me a text like, yo, you need to check this out. Boom, 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 boom. You drop a bunch of stuff, which I appreciate. So yeah, it, it makes total sense. Can, can I ask one more question? And then we'll, I guess we'll get to the questions in the chat. Can you, can you talk about, um, can you talk about this pleasure piece? <laughs> uh, the answer is no. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, I really wanted to like, so um, with that pleasure piece in particular, I wanted to make an object where uh, that was interactive, that held uh, the kind of, of this notion of, of, of the plantation, like how black bodies function as uh, pleasure and leisure for white people on the plantation, but at the same time, talk about the diseases of despair uh, in the black communities mm. and uh, a, an object that really um, uh, held the, the, this notion of adver targeted advertisement and uh, a few other things I don't care to talk about. Like I, my, my, personal, um, my personal narrative is my father 
like most of this work is the most personal work that I've made here today. So this Anita Hill, this, uh, this uh, Rodney King piece and this pleasure piece, they were all very personal to me because they are things that happen to my family, my immediate family. And uh, like trauma that I, I live with on a personal level. Um, and I wanted to like really make an object that spoke to that, but indirectly and something that everyone could access, walk through, um, you know, like, and particularly like if, if, if this particular image that's up right now of these uh, uh, five objects, um, like the, my choice, I think in a question, someone asked something about what, why did you use the beads themselves um, as a, a, a function of, um, or a material, why did you, why did you decide to use that as like a way of uh, rendering these images? And I just simply uh, say that like the beads themselves function as uh, a black pixel in my studio practice. And I really mm -hmm. wanted to um, re-render some of this trauma with a black pixel and erasing the white gaze and the, and the process of doing that. So yeah, Thanks, I guess. Man. That, that's the overarching. And also um, you asked a question earlier, this pleasure piece runs parallel to the, uh, the basketball uh, hoop. So it, and Anita Hill faces towards you time you walk into the exhibition. She's the first image that you confront. Wow. I like the way you say confront. I never thought of, I never, I never thought of a beaded curtain confronting anybody, but damn it, they do confront, I'll tell you that much. Yes, sir. Uh, so do we have any, uh, Neil, do we have any questions or anything? We have a few minutes left. And I wonder if we can talk for a second also about like the joy, Philanders, of the long, the joy and terror possibly of the long nets. Can we talk about that in Jackson at all? No, hey, no. <laughs> you made the sound of those long nets. Yes, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, um, I heard that like when I the first time, you know, when you sent that to me, I heard it like I heard that image. Yeah, but, it, but if you look at the base of that image, there's uh, these shots, like these miniature, uh, the nips uh, at the base of that wow. those long image. Yeah. So I really wanted to make an object that confronted this notion of, of you know, like the diseases of despair. Oh, so, sorry, that image. Yes. Like right there at the base, yeah. um, like the the alcoholism was really big in that that space, you know. Yes. Um, also, um, there's the, there's uh, basketball in Jackson, Mississippi was near a, a religion at a certain point. Religious. Uh, right. it's about uh, uh, in a ten year period, what is it? Was it about twenty five guys went to the NBA? From the and same so, neighborhood, damn near, right? From the same neighborhood, yeah. And um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that, like honor those guys, but at the same time, talk about the trauma that was embedded in those moments, you know? Man, oh man, oh but, man. I mean, that's Jesse Pate right there, fam. Yeah, rest yeah. in peace, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. So so we do we have any more? Do we have any questions? Did, did, could you show do you guys have a photo of that self-portrait? That's what I was just gonna say. It's the self-portrait, which I think anchors a lot of your ideas. I love I love the self-portrait just by putting it in a separate wall here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think I, I called um I think I called Charlie directly after this, and I think I text Noel and PSA this image once I finished it. Uh, this I drew this uh, initially on the flight to Paris, and um, just like having some black joy, having some black leisure with my family, and um, I think you and I had just started to dialogue about the possibility of having this show. And I started thinking about like unpacking my childhood because I really felt that I, the need to make uh, the most personal work that I could possibly possibly make in this moment. And I was considering uh, 
like moments of my childhood that had joy and also um, this kind of um, uh, tension in them. And I remember um, this image in particular, uh, the day I actually shot this photograph and um, how disheveled I was. And, um, and, and this is the very first image that um, was taken without uh, black joy and black care at the center of it in my uh, mm. lifetime. This is my first grade uh, photograph. I was inter integrating, you know, uh, public schools in Jackson. Uh, Jackson, where we're from, uh, where Kiese and I are from, uh, integrated late and gradually. And um, I just wanted to reauthor this image with a black pixel, you know. And, yeah. That's stunning, man. That is stunning. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Thank you, brother. Yeah. What do you call, I mean, like, you know, we work in words and Charlie works in sound and words, but what do you call this? Like, what do you call that technique that makes it look like it's wet, like it's rain, like, like the, like the, the image looks like, it, like the image looks like it is rainy. Like, what is that? What is that called? I, I don't have an answer for it. I okay. just, you know, I'm just playing, brother. Yo, you know what I mean? Sick, man. Yes. A lot of things that don't have names for it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Things don't, things that, Charlie, you know, there's things don't have names because they get new. Exactly. <laughs> Once, those exactly. Are advents, right? Those are advents. When things, when things are no longer new, they all get prescribed names. And, and names. Become, and it, yeah, that's the beginning killed. of definition. That's right. When you become, when you get a name, you, you become killed. That's how they get yes, you. Sir. Uh, so we have a few minutes left, you know, uh, and I really want to make sure that everyone in the, who has questions could probably have their questions answered. So uh, can we can we get some questions or no? Yeah, we got um, we got some time for some questions. Read them um, out, sir. I, I have um, a really great question from somebody named Ying. Um, and I think this is actually interesting because, uh, Noel, if I remember correctly, you wrote about this in your essay. Um, would you consider to make your work um, interactive with the audience uh, by having them walk through the work, um, activate the sound of the beads? That's the answer is yes. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that permission for everybody to come visit and uh, run through the beads? <laughs> yes, but they must straighten them up afterwards. We're not cleaning <laughs> up afterwards. <laughs> so wait a minute. So so that's interesting. So in that logic, pleasure is meant to be walked through. Experience. Pleasure is meant to be experienced. Yeah, it is. Ah, yes, okay. It's, it's, okay. Very good. Very good. We have any more questions, Cam? Yeah. Um, here's a question from Amira. Um, they say, it's a real treat to hear this exchange of concepts and ideas around both the multidimensional aspects of Blackness through material and concept and memory. I was wondering how you came upon the concept of the Black Pixel. Oh, uh, me specifically? Okay, um, I'm getting a notice that my internet is uh, not stable, but um, well, like I was really thinking very specifically about the, the white gaze and how it functions in, um, in photography. Uh, the, the camera functions as the white gaze. And if we're gonna think about images being disseminated over the internet, we have to consider a pixel. So therefore, I, I, it's like a one-to-one -one relationship. What could function as a, a, a black pixel? And I began mining things, uh, I guess about uh, somewhere around 10 years ago, I started finding different materials that I wanted to experiment with as I got back to this notion of, I think I mentioned this earlier in the conversation about this notion of wanting to get back to my initial impulses as an artist. And with that, I was like, how can I make paintings, use materials and figure out ways to reauthor images of power for my childhood? and re-examine and reinvestigate those spaces, but articulate that in a format that mirrored how people receive images. So the compositions themselves are shaped like um, selfies. That's the close cropping of the image. But then if they're gonna be a selfie, they have to be auth authored in a way that articulates the notion of a pixel because how, would, how else would you, um, 
encounter uh, an image that is a selfie, and that's through uh, not printed a pre printed medium, but more or less through the um, this notion of pixelation. So there we are, and that's how I got to it. It was just a long process reduction over maybe five years thinking about and playing with materials to arrive at that point. I had used other materials in place of a black pixel prior, but this was the most significant um, uh, conceptual um, um, adjustment I made in that process. That's a good answer. That's what's up. Well, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yeah, so um, one more question. We've got a question from uh, Burgo. Um, Noel, I remember you telling me about your project that compared black skin to the leather on basketballs and footballs. It's so powerful now seeing this basketball hoop piece. It's like a full circle. Um, the connection reminds me of what you said about creating a community with those jokes about getting whooped. Did you think about your piece while viewing Philandus? Says. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Which one was that? Um, no, I don't think so. Sorry, Burgo. Burgo, no. one of my students. No, not at all. Uh, but 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 honestly, the way Philandus and I think about imagery, because we we we're friends, we're close friends, like brothers, is very similar, right? That that if yeah. in fact um, if in fact the image we receive comes from data, which in itself is conceptual and not real, then the image can't be real, right? So all of these things are circulating, not just for me. I would I would I would think the same way with Philandus, with Flip. All these ideas don't circulate just through the image proper, which is a two-dimensional form, but function through images expansive, which could also be three-dimensional things. So the basketball uh, uh, object that's on the wall uh, is also an image in the sense that um, it is representational or it's a sign of some kind of blackness. Does that make sense? And I, and I would I would actually argue that your understanding of uh, Flannis of the black pixel is an extension of everything that's in that space. So even the objects themselves that don't use black black pixels proper are are itself a reference to the black pixel. You dig? And we could I could break that down even deeper, but we don't we don't got to go there. You feel me? Right, 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 right. But but Noel and I have <laughs> been in dialogue for the last thirteen years solid. Tell them like constant, sure. like uh, eight hours in a day, print, printing together and doing stuff together. Yeah, so. preach to them. Preach to him, preach. Yeah. But I just want to say, man, Flip, thanks for having, allowing me to participate today. I, I'm sure everybody else would say the same thing. Yes, sir. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you deeply. Thank, thank you. So can we remind the folks, how, how long does this show up? I, I got a whole thing, man. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, do you mind, do you mind uh, allowing uh, Kiese to mention his book and Charlie oh, yeah. to mention the name of his book? Uh, Absolutely. Before we get out of here? Plug yeah, away. Do that. Do it. Um, I got uh, I got a new book coming out uh, June first. New old book called Long Division and Heavy American Memoirs already out anywhere. So hope y'all spend some time with those books. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have uh, two books of poetry that are out. Senders Rekindle, and that's and my latest book is called Embers Among the Ashes: Poems in a Haiku Manner. Mm. I did the cover to, for that one. That's right. Philandis <laughs> oh, did the cover to the poem. Yes, yes, yes. And hopefully he'll do the cover to the next one. Are we doing shout outs now? Oh, okay. No, thanks to the, the brilliant curator, Allison Glenn. She put me in the Promise Witness Remembrance uh, Brianna Taylor show at the Speed Art Museum. Uh, my, ra my race, Ebony, works over there. Holland Collar just Holland, Holland Cotter wrote the review for the New York mm. Times. We just did the NPR Saturday. I'm hanging with the giant Sam Gilliam, yes, Lauren sir. Clinton, Terry Atkins. Listen, and Miss Louisville by, by, by way of Mississippi. Don't play yourself, <laughs> sir. <laughs> My grandmother okay, knew him. Okay. Don't play. But I appreciate <laughs> you, man. I appreciate you. Awesome. With that, uh, with that out of the way, uh, thank you all so much for tuning into this conversation tonight. Uh, thank you again to our panelists and thank you Philandis for creating the work that sparked so many really interesting moments in tonight's talk. Um, the solo exhibition, The Things That Haunt Me Still is on view now through May 30th. Uh, for more information such as our open hours, visit our website at www.realartways.org. 
Uh, thanks again and have a wonderful rest of your eating, everyone. Thank you so much.